Hello, good day. Thanks for coming out. Well, as you know, 3D was created, I think, around the 50s to kind of compete with television. Am I right? Is that just a way to kind of draw people back into the theaters? Yes. Um, and yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting. Uh, 3D ends up coming up a lot when the movies get in trouble. They turn to things like 3D. And the 50s, yeah, yeah if television and there was, was a big threat. there different versions of that. I know around um, the late 70s, there was something called stereo vision. I think early 70s, something called over and under, where you wouldn't need two projectors, where they would actually have the two images on one piece of film above and below in one frame, squeeze, and that sort of worked for some porn movies and things like that. And then um, <laughs> later in the, in the, in the uh, decade, stereo vision, which was an anamorphic system where you had the images, two images, the left and the right eye squeezed um, on the left and the right of a, of a large frame. And that kind of be caused a whole resurgence of uh, re-releases and movies in the 80s that were in 3D, including Jaws 3D and Coming at you, and I remember in the early '80s, I went to see the first thing that come out that, that kind of started movies again in the '80s in 3D was a re-release of House of Wax. It was um, Vincent Price's movie. I, Did I you go see that? At the re yeah, it scared the heck out of me. And yeah. I remember just walking in on the theater and seeing. I walked in late, and it was <laughs> right when he swoops up in oh, front of the audience. Oh, when he swings into the yeah, close-up. Yeah, everyone oh, just everyone just screamed, and I just remember sitting there with the glasses, and when the guy has the paddle ball and he's paddling, that's the best effect in the audience. He's paddling yeah, yeah. a paddle ball in, into the audience. Great moment. I kept looking, lifting the glasses up and down to see, one, what the effect was, and then one, how it was done, to see how far apart the two eyes really were to get it to come that far off screen. I was fascinated by it back then. But then in around 2001, I'd been shooting HD movies. I shot Spy Kids 1 and Spy Kids 2. And I didn't have any ideas to do a third Spy Kids. I, I did have an idea for doing a, a kids movie, Tron-like, where kids would go into a video game. And once you got in the game, you would, it would turn to 3D. And I thought, wow, these HD cameras, I can do anything. I bet I could probably just strap two HD cameras as close as I can together. And it won't be like a traditional 3D where you shoot through a mirror. But maybe in post, if I shoot it all on green screen, I can, I can make it closer to get, make the images mirror each other a little more by squeezing them together. That was my idea. I never actually ever got around to trying it because we ended up using a traditional mirror system. But we did some tests in 3D by just taking footage from Spy Kids 2 and adding some CG 3D elements. Now at this time, nobody was making 3D movies. There had not been a theatrical release since the 80s. I just wanted to do it and I decided, I know, I'll just call it Spy Kids 3D. I'll just make it a Spy Kids movie. It's about kids in a video game. So I got so excited about the idea, I told Bob Weinstein, um, I was still finishing Spy Kids 2, it was the end of 2002, and I said, we can have another movie out by next summer, we'll call it Spy Kids 3D, and he asked, do you know how to do 3D? <laughs> I said, no, but we'll have it figured out by then. <laughs> so um, we kind of made up the process as we went. Um, and this movie, Coraline, which, which I couldn't get going for a while, um, I first read the galleys back in the, like 2000, before it was ever published as a book, but I've been writing it, rewriting it, and imagining it for quite a long time. It just, just the timing worked out so that three and a half years ago, the movie got greenlit. 3D was, was now a possibility, with at least the, the, the current version, which is it's very good. Um, the two things came together. We shot some tests. Uh, we figured out, well, you know, we can't really put two lenses together. Everything's miniature. And when you, when you shoot live action, the, the, the idea of 3D is, two eyes, and the lenses would be about as far apart as your eyes are. But if your puppets are seven or 10 inches tall, the lenses have to be like that. Um, we finally figured out, because it's stop motion, and the puppets hold their pose as long as they need to, we would shoot the left eye as a single frame, and then the whole camera would shift slightly um, to shoot the right frame. And we, we developed a a pretty unique vocabulary of 3D because not only can we shoot 3D, but we can control how much 3D we can, we can it's called the interocular distance, the distance between the two lenses, the eyes. Um, the wider, the more of an effect there is, the narrower, the less. And we actually shifted that during shots. We, we um, you know, I, I saw it as this great device to first off capture what we do we can't do the things CG can do. CG can do things faster, smoother, sexier, chrome, lubricant. It's all 
so lovely. But the unique thing about what we, we, we have is that, well, the shit's real. It's there. Well, for, for Coraline, um, we did design it really specifically for, for 3D, so it, it, works, it works best um, that way. Uh, I, think, I think if the movies, if they don't just use as a gimmick, I think there's a very long future. The, the modern technology is it's just much better than how it was in the 50s. Um, the, uh, so the quality of the experience is really good and, and improving as the uh, projection gets better. What I see, and, and I'd love to hear Robert's opinion, is it's going to happen that film projectors are going to just be gone. I mean, it just makes too much economic sense to get digital projectors. Um, and 3D is an add-on with a digital projection. But with digital, there's just the, the cost of making prints of, of films, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. The cost of shipping them is a, is a lot of money. So clearly, digital projection is going to happen. And 3D, it's you know, like I said, it's, a, it's an add-on, so it's sort of an, an optional thing, and it just depends on how well uh, the 3D is used, I think. I think, I think it's, we've, we've crossed the threshold where it's not gonna just come and go like it did in the 50s. Um, there'll be some stinkers and some that, that use it well. There'll be definitely some films. I don't think The Wrestler needed to be in 3D. <laughs> uh, but some people will put a film like that in 3D, and, and it may actually hurt the film. I mean, I think some, I think it's some of the big tentpole pictures that studios count on now to make money probably all work great in 3D. They're all action movies, they're all, you know, Transformers and all these sort of things. Probably would work great at the premium prices in certain theaters where you can see it in 3D at work and where it does. I mean, that's the great thing about shooting 3D is that you're shooting two eyes and you don't have to project it 3D. You can just use one of the eyes and it's a regular movie. So you, but you do have that option. So if, if, if the option isn't that much more expensive, depending on what you're doing, then it's worth doing and having for the longevity of who knows what's you know in the future. If, um, if that's gonna make an even bigger DVD sale because you can then sell 3D versions of Appetite for people who now have a home system that's 3D, they're gonna want more, more than five or six movies. So I think it'll, it'll last longer than it did before, but it's, it's really about the audience at a point where they're just tired of seeing it and not really supporting it. But if the cost can come down and it's not that much more to do it that way, then it, then it makes sense. They make a lot more on the 3D screens right now.